was I can sign some books and uh, yes. I do have one question. I read the uh, New York Times interview. Uh huh. And so I might not be remembering. But uh, did he ever ask about John Walker Lind at all? Oh, um, he and didn't. did anyone ask you about that, actually? He no. didn't. I refer to him in the book. I mean, he's you such do. a fast, okay. fascinating character. And there was a great Esquire magazine piece about, about John Walker Lind uh, a couple of years back. I mean, he, he sits in prison now. And, you know, he's not allowed to really see anybody. And he's one of the most devout Muslims, uh, um, you know, and... and uh, uh, his father's journey is, is very interesting as well. I mean, this was a boy who was raised in Marin, you know, of, of privilege and decided at a very young age, like 15 or 16, that he wanted to convert to, to, to Islam and, and went on this journey that landed him in a, you know, in a, in a prison in, in uh, uh, was he, he was in Iraq, right? Or, no, he was in Afghanistan, yeah. Um, and, you know, arrested as an enemy combatant. Uh, and, you know, I started this book in 2007 when George Bush was president, and I wrote about 100 pages, and then I went off to do a television show, and when I came back to it, uh, you know, uh, Obama was being elected president, and I realized, looking back at the book, that a lot of the details were no longer really relevant. So I changed the date in the book to 2000 blank, so that you could just, you know, insert your own date and make it contemporary. Um, but originally I had had Daniel as arrested as an enemy combatant and that whole language of the war on terror, which is kind of, it's, it's not that it's disappeared, it's just kind of hidden now. I mean, people still seem to be treated in a similar manner, we just don't like shout, shout it uh, out loud. So, um, But, you know, he was another young man, like, I mean, I think part of what this book explores for me is this sort of lone gunman archetype and this idea that in this country, for whatever reason, we have these young men between 18 and 25 who fall in, who get lost, I think, in this country, which is so big and and, um, and so easy to get lost in. And for young men of this age who are at the greatest risk, um, uh, you know, they're the most zealous they'll ever be in their lives. Uh, and if they don't have a kind of prop tr proper structure and they're a little bit off, maybe, um, you know, you can end up really going down a, a wrong path. But what's interesting, and another reason that I include these sort of real life cases in here is that you read them and they don't, they don't read like a novel. They don't read like a linear story where you go, oh well, it was so clear at this moment that 10 years later he was going to do this. I mean, at any moment along the journey, any of these guys could have made a different choice or something different could have happened to them and they wouldn't have ended up doing what they did. And, I've, and that's what makes it a tragedy. And I think, you know, that idea for Daniel is that, you know, he could have, he had... You see these moments, these painful moments. He found this family in Iowa who, who would have taken him in. You know, they liked him, and they would have taken him in. And he met a girl in Austin who, you know, was really into him. And but he was already too far gone. And, you know, all these moments where he could have just made a different choice and would have ended up in a different place. So, yeah, yeah. So you've talked a bit about the genesis of the book, uh -huh. um, but as it opens, I thought very much about the Gabby Gifford shooting, oh, yeah. and that's talked about uh -huh. at length in the book, yeah. but it must have happened after you were well into this novel. Yeah, it actually, when we, I finished the book, and we were about to shop it to publishers, and, and Jared Loeffner, you know, shot all those people in, in the Arizona parking lot, and, and of course we... We paused, we didn't shop the book, and I, I went back and kind of incorporated some of those details into the book because it felt like the book immediately became dated without reference to that in there. At the same time, what can you really know in the first weeks after those sorts of things? But, you know, one of the things that struck me was, you know, that there's that famous mug shot of Jared Lawfare oh, yeah. where he's, he's just shaved his head and he's like wall eyed and grinning and like he looks crazy. And for a father who's looking for his son, you know, in these people, it's so easy for him to go, well, that's not my son. My son isn't this crazy person, you know, which is the lengths we'll go to to kind of convince ourselves that our children are what we want them to be, I think. I mean, it, I think it's, you know, it's uh, short-sighted to think that one photograph would tell you anything about anybody. And, and uh, clearly there are moments for Daniel in his journey that are much darker and sort of more mentally unstable than, than, than other moments. And there is a section in the book of, of Daniel's journals that, that, uh, that, that give you a taste of how 
how far he, he went. Um, but I didn't want it to be easy for the reader. I didn't want to explain him. I wanted there to be a level of detachment to those sections about the sun where it was up to you. I mean, this, this moment with the tornado, you know, where he, he could be killed and it's, it's clearly an awesome moment for him, uh, you know, a terrifying and larger than life moment. But what does it mean? I mean, does it, how does it shape him? How does it affect him? I, I can't tell you, but knowing that he went through it, um, I think you start to feel a certain way about him. You know, clearly uh, these things are happening to him and he's reacting to them in a certain way, a way that maybe you identify with or maybe seems crazy to you. Um, but I wanted the reader to have to decide for themselves whether, um, uh, you know, whether this is a, a crazy kid or a sane kid or, or what the moment is that, that might have turned it. So. Is yeah. that your title? It was my title, yeah. And, and um, when we sold it to Doubleday, they, um, we, we didn't really talk about changing it. I think they might have felt like, you know, we've got the good wife on TV and their good mother. Or, you know, I mean, like, but you keep coming back to the fact that it is the central question of the book is, is he a good father or isn't he? You know, was he one when Daniel was growing up? Can he make up for it by, by being one now? But at the same time, he's on this quest. He's, you know, he's chasing these windmills, and he has this new family with these two sons who he finds himself not paying as much attention to as he should, and maybe going back to these old patterns. And, and you start to wonder, well, does he have to be a bad father to, to the, his new kids to be a good father to his old kids? So it, it is the central um, you know, question of the book. Um, you know, I was in England last week doing publicity for the book and, and um, one of the publicists there told me that, you know, at the publisher all the men read the book and and the, they were weeping at the end and all the women were you know coming out of it, you know, very polarized about if he was a good father or not, you know, because it's it's very different, you know, motherhood and fatherhood and, and the relationships of mothers and fathers to kids and, and uh, you know, I mean I stand around I go to a lot of four year old birthday parties. <laughs> And I stand around with a lot of other dads talking about how our dads never went to our four-year-old birthday parties. It just wasn't something that, that we did. Um, but, you know, fathers have become so much more engaged in the emotional lives of their children to the point where you can be at work and feel guilty for having to work, you know, um, instead of missing that soccer game or all those sorts of things. So I think we're, we're at a point where, where as fathers we don't know how far to go, like, am I a bad father for having to work on a Saturday, or the things that you need to support your family, and, you know, certainly mothers feel the same way when they have to work, and, but, you know, I think fatherhood becomes much more of a cultural issue now, that, that, that men are playing a larger role in, in, in the families, and I realized with some horror recently that I would written a book that requires me to talk at length about two subjects to get you in trouble 100% of the time, which is politics and parenting. So, um, so I've been very careful. And of course, in England, they all they want to talk about is guns, uh, which also gets you into trouble. Um, so I don't have any, you know, conclusions about fatherhood or about politics uh, to, to share with you. But, but I will say that that you know, I think you realize at a certain point that that your kids are the, probably the most important thing that you will do in your life. And there's no handbook, and each one's different, and you, you know, and and um, it's it's if you let it, it can drive you crazy. But like, did I did I handle that right? And and um, you spend a lot of time talking about it, so.